Thank you very much. Um, I want you to be honest with me. How many people of you knew there was something called a space lawyer before right now? Almost no one. I, I'm not surprised and I don't blame you because actually even the Huffington Post only found out last year that we exist, right? <laughs> and it's one thing to exist, it's one thing to be a thing, it's another thing to be a welcome thing. <laughs> There's many scientists and engineers and entrepreneurs who think we are an expensive nuisance, we are troublemakers of no good use whatsoever. For example, back in the old days, there was a pilot who took his friend for a ride in the sky and they got lost over the cloud cover. Now, there was no GPS in that time, of course, so the pilot said to his friend, the only thing I can do is try to go below the clouds and see whether we can see a landmark and find out where we are. And so they did, and indeed, at about 300 feet above the ground, they were under the cloud cover, but the pilot still couldn't see a thing. So he turned to his friend and said, do you have any idea where we are? And the friend said, well, we are in an aircraft 300 feet above the ground. Bloody lawyer, said the pilot. <laughs> what, what do you mean, said his friend, who was, of course, a little bit annoyed. Well, look at what you're saying. It's 100% accurate and totally useless. <laughs> of course, the lawyer had the last word. Yeah, I'm not going to crack a lawyer joke without the lawyer having the last word, right? So the lawyer said, well, you sure talk like a pilot. Why is that, said the pilot. Well, you don't know where the hell you are. You don't know where the hell you're going. Now you ask someone. You're in the same position as before, but all of a sudden the lawyer is to blame. <laughs> so I guess if you want to fly to the moon and something happens, don't blame me if you don't ask me before, right? So let's talk about the moon or maybe even about Mars, because you may have heard that Elon Musk has recently announced plans to go there, to send private individuals there within 10 years from now. And President Obama uh, backed that up with an even more recent statement saying by 2030 we will put astronauts back on Mars. Or not actually back on Mars, because nobody's been there yet. But I think we should do a little bit of a reality check here. I think you need three things to make these kind of flights happen. The first thing is the technology. So let's get ourselves a sense of what the technology currently tells us. Now, I, I'd like another show of hands. How many of you have done this? Flown a single ale aircraft across the continent? Pretty much everyone, no surprise there. This is technology we all use, we all know, we've, we've even trusted for thousands of times probably. How many of you have done this? Flown a wide body, for an international flight, intercontinental flight. Still a sizable amount. Of course, again, no surprise, because this is essentially the same technology. How many of you have done this? <laughs> I'm happy to see that no one is bluffing, because this thing hasn't flown yet. <laughs> At least not with space tourists on board. This is the White Knight 2, which is carrying the Spaceship 2, which is currently being built by Virgin Galactic, the company of Richard Branson. And this is what it's going to do. It's going to take off from a normal runway, fly up to about 15 kilometers, then the Spaceship drops from underneath the aircraft, goes on its own account to about 110 kilometers, and then coasts all the way back to Earth. And within an hour, you're back where you came from. Virgin Galactic, moreover, is not the only game in town. There are close to a dozen companies which are currently developing these kind of technologies. Some of them even aim higher than 110 kilometers. For example, Boeing is aiming to dock with the space station, which is orbiting the Earth in a few years from now. So, the, and talking about the space station, by the way, we have already actually seen seven tourists, six men and one woman, going on there to enjoy themselves for a full week. And one of them even liked it so much that he went twice. And as for the moon, of course, we all know, or at least I assume everyone knows, that we've, uh, in history we've seen 12 US astronauts actually being landed on the moon. So the technology is probably not the big issue. That brings us then to the second issue, the money thing, right? Who's going to pay for that and how much does it cost? Again, let's, let's get ourselves some sense of these prices. I came here from Amsterdam, which is about 950 kilometers, and I think it's fair to say that a return ticket, you can't get anything cheaper than 100 euros, but you may also get something for a 200 or a 300 euros, 
depending, of course, on when you buy your ticket. We talked about transatlantic flights. Vienna, New York is, for example, close to 7,000 kilometers, but the price is still, I assume, within everyone's budget. 800 euros, maybe 1,000, maybe 1,500. But now watch this. Outer space is only 100 kilometers from here. Straight up. <laughs> An official. The price tag for that, a quarter of a million dollars. And don't be mistaken, more than, four, more than 500 people actually have already signed up for this, have put down deposits because they want to take those flights. We spoke about the International Space Station that's orbiting at about 400 kilometers altitude. And again, keep in mind, eh, the food is horrible, there's no shower, there's no bed, <laughs> there's no privacy, you just have a nice view, right? These men and women paid each more than $20 million for a week on board. Now, the space station is 400 kilometers. The moon is 400,000 kilometers. So you can imagine that if we talk about the return ticket for a human being, we talk about at least tens to hundreds of billions, and it doesn't make any difference whether we talk about euros or dollars, of course. <laughs> And at that amount, you can also imagine why a trip to Mars, which is 225 million kilometers, doesn't even fit on the slide. <laughs> so let's be a little bit more realistic and talk about space tourism close to Earth. As I said, the technology is almost there. Now, suppose that somebody else is paying for you that quarter of a million. How many of you would be willing to go? Great, great. There's still a number of people who didn't raise their hand. And I'm imagining that part of those, the reasons why those people didn't raise their hand is that they are afraid of this. Well, okay. <laughs> Maybe something a little bit worse, but right? They could get injured, they could die on the flight. And that's where the law comes in. Now, you, you may ask the law. The law is just a piece of paper. Yes, but the law knows a concept called liability. If someone causes damage to someone else or injures someone else, someone has to pay to someone else, right? And the law can provide for that. Unfortunately, that's where the problems start, because what damage has to be compensated? How much does the person who is liable for that have to pay? Uh, to whom does he have to pay that? And if they have a dispute over that, who settles the dispute? Who's going to make the decision that somebody's actually got to pay out, right? So that's where the law comes in. Now, the problem with the law is that this all depends on what type of vehicle are you flying on. Are you flying on an aircraft? Is it an aircraft? Is it the spacecraft? Is it? No, it's not Superman. <laughs> because then you would be safe in any event, right? But if it's an aircraft, it would be air law which applies. If it would be a spacecraft, it would be space law which would apply. And that makes a difference. Let's start to talk about space law. First, there is fortunately a rule which says that states, which are the entities with the deepest pockets, are responsible and liable for damage caused in outer space. So that's a good thing. However, this does not include damage suffered by passengers on board of spacecraft. So that's a bad thing. Nothing is internationally arranged for that. So we might have to look at national laws on, on solving this issue. Now, there are a number of national laws around. If we would have more time, we could pay, play f fun with flags, but obviously I won't do that right here. <laughs> but the point I'm making here is this is the status quo in terms of members, countries of the United Nations across the world, which have drafted national laws dealing with private space activities. Not specifically space tourism, any, spy, any private activities. And not only do they all deal with this issue differently, but there are many other countries which are totally missing, as you can see. So again, let's have a look at what these laws then provide. Uh, or let's have a look at air law and see what air law provides. Well, international air law says that airlines are going to pay up for damage, which is good. And actually, in real life, these compensations can go to quite great limits. So there's a lot of money which you can get if you're injured which of course means that the airlines then will take utmost caution to fly safe. They pay a lot of money to fly safe rather than be sorry after the fact, and liability is a main reason for that. So this is a good thing, right? Now, it still leaves us with the question, 
What are we flying on if we are space tourists? Are we flying on an aircraft, which is defined as anything with wings or rotors, or anything operating as a balloon? Or are we flying as a spacecraft, which is defined as any man-made object launched into outer space, including its launch vehicle, if that is different from the craft that is launched into outer space? So a quick side note that, of course, already raises the question, where is outer space? Well, the lawyers haven't settled on this yet, but let's assume for, uh, for practical purposes that outer space begins at 100 kilometers above the Earth. You may recall my earlier slide about that. So that's where we deal with. But we're still stuck with the issue of these vehicles that are being developed. Are they aircraft? Is it an aircraft? Is it a spacecraft? Or is it both? This, for example, is the Lynx vehicle. It looks like an aircraft because it has wings, yet it goes to 110 kilometers soon, so it's a spacecraft from that perspective. We've seen this one before. This is the Virgin Galactic aircraft again, which is carrying the spacecraft, which goes into outer space, but the spacecraft looks like an aircraft because it also has wings. And the aircraft, because it launches the spacecraft, is the launch vehicle of the spacecraft and therefore also qualifies as a launch vehicle. So you really need lawyers to sort this out, right? <laughs> this one would be relatively easy. It doesn't have wings, look like a standard rocket. This is a space object. No, not you again. <laughs> but this contraption, anyone, any idea? I have no idea. It doesn't look like an aircraft to me, but it also doesn't look like a spacecraft to me. So we're still stuck with this question. This one looks more like the Apollo capsules of old, clearly a spacecraft, no wings whatsoever. This, by contrast, is uh, going to be launched into outer space on top of a rocket, but then it's going to fly down because it has wings. So it could be, again, both or either, whatever you want. And then, of course, there's the Boeing vehicle, which again looks like a more classical spacecraft. Now, the lawmakers of the world have so far addressed this issue only in a few areas in terms of how shall we address that, legally speaking. First of all, the United States, um, which has actually addressed this as a space flight. So, if you're wounded, don't claim any liability. Because, the only, because you have signed prior to your flight an informed consent clause, which means that you recognize you are flying on a vehicle not certified for safety by the US government. In other words, if you get hurt, don't whine, it's your own choice. Take your own risk. This is, of course, a very operator-friendly approach, right? Uh, which means that by now, all these activities are going to be developed in the United States. Now, let's go to Europe for a moment. Also in Europe, there is a fundamental choice. Do we treat it as a space law, as a space vehicle used for, for the flight? in which case there would probably be no liability, maybe something like informed consent, or do we treat it as an aircraft, in which case we are immediately into business if something bad happens, because there's a lot of money involved, as I said. Now, the real-life situation in Europe is very complicated. There are at least four countries who are developing serious projects in this regard, and they all treat the issue differently. So, for example, in Sweden, they have a national space law, which could pretty well address the issue, However, then after a certain period, they started to doubt themselves and they're now thinking of applying air law. So basically, we don't know what's going to happen there. <laughs> there are plans in Scotland and in, the, in England uh, to develop these spacecraft. Now, these are, of course, both part of the United Kingdom, at least until now. <laughs> Nobody knows what's going to happen. The UK has a national space law, but it has chosen not to apply it and rather go to air law for arranging these kinds of flights. Then there is the island of Curaçao, which has happened to be part of the Netherlands, my country. Now, the Netherlands has a national space law, but it doesn't apply to Curaçao for in here international <laughs> internal political reasons. So Curaçao is currently developing its own national space law, which looks like it's going to probably follow the US model. And then finally, in Catalonia, around Barcelona, there are serious plans. Now, of course, Catalonia is, is a province of Spain. Spain does not have any national space law yet, and it has not indicated whether it wants to draft one on this account or whether it prefers to use air law for that. Now, to make things even worse, the, United, uh, sorry, the European Commission, at some point, tried to harmonize some of all this mess. 
And they said, you know what? Why don't we treat it at a European level as air flight, as an aircraft flying passengers on a special trip to the edge of outer space? But then again, there is no automatic application of the liability because it's a special air flight. And even worse, the commission got stopped in its tracks. So we are basically live, left with a big mess. Are you still interested? <laughs> if you're interested, who would be willing to fly under US law from within US jurisdiction? <coughs> Show of hands, please. Still a sizable amount. Who would prefer to wait maybe a few decades until the Europeans got their act together? <coughs> Equal size of hands. Okay, and who amongst you would at least like to have the lawyer friend joining them on board to be safe? <laughs> Thank you very much for saving my day. <laughs>